as a, a little refresher or introduction for anyone who hasn't uh, been to one of these before, uh, PSC is a nonprofit organization uh, with a mission to advance business through environmental and social practices. Uh, down here, uh, we are a movement of retailers, distributors, manufacturers, and brands coming together to measure, improve, and celebrate our environmental and social impact. We were originally founded in 2013 with about eight members and currently have nearly 200 members internationally um, across the globe, except for every continent, except for Antarctica. Um, just a little bit about what we do and why it's important. So it's important to know that there are two primary ways that we work as an organization. First, we help our member organizations on their sustainability journey. We provide them with a suite of membership benefits that incentivize them to measure and improve their impact. And then second, we look to, we look to uh, different areas or areas of impact that are too large for companies uh, to solve on their own. And just a little reminder of the etiquette for today's webinar, uh, micro microphones and videos are off, uh, questions and answers will using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. There will also be a chat box with PSC staff is monitoring and uh, recording and slides will be sent to all registrants after today's webinar. Now, just want to give a, uh, have a quick word from our message from our sponsor, which is M Fiber, and I'm gonna let this speak for itself. My name is Dustin Dover with M Fiber. I'm very excited to be a part of PSE's growing webinar series. It's important that we all continue to grow in our sustainability journey, and the Pet Sustainability Coalition is dedicated to offering the education our team needs to pursue that goal. At M Fiber, we are a vertically integrated ag business that provides the most sustainable fiber for pet food. We have worked with the Pet Sustainability Coalition on a life cycle analysis to demonstrate just how sustainable our ingredient is. I believe that documented success brings value to the end consumer and the Pet Sustainability Coalition has the tools to help us show our progress. Join us over the next few weeks as we continue to grow in our education with this pet sustainability webinar series. And if you're looking for the most sustainable fiber in pet food, shoot me an email, ddover at mfiber.net. I would love to visit with you. All right, thank you. Now, just some, I'd like to introduce you to our guest speaker today. Her name is Abigail Keller. Abigail originally worked on an organic waste team and now uses her knowledge and passion for sustainability to help manufacturers and distributors find innovative solutions for their waste types. Abigail will be walking us through today. Uh, she is from North Star Recycling and we're excited to, to have her with us today. So Abigail, I'm gonna let you take the screen. Awesome. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. Uh, Abigail Keller, again, Melissa Recycling. Um, I'm going to share my screen as well. Um, hopefully everybody can see it. Uh, really happy to be here. Thank you for PSC for inviting me um, to this webinar. I don't get to speak on these as often as I'd like, especially with um, the current times. And it's just really nice to be on, um, on screen and, and be able to share a lot of useful information with a lot of different people. So um, I'm going to walk through a little presentation I put together. Um, I just wanted to quickly share the prompt again that Melissa kindly set out with the invite. Um, but the goal of this conversation is just to give pretty much a big overarching summary of waste and recycling and all the amazing things that you can do to improve your program um, regarding sustainability, costs, um, efficiency, et cetera. And I just want to really share the knowledge that I have about um, the industry um, based on what uh, North Star Recycling does today in, in the waste and recycling world um, with you all. So um, I have a lot to share. I've got you know a number of minutes to share, so I will speak a little quickly, but um, hopefully I get the point across. And this, again, this presentation will be shared afterwards if anyone wants to uh, glean a little bit more. 
Um, so for today's discussion, I'm going to share a little bit about North Star, a little bit about industry trends, waste diversification. I want to talk about zero waste to landfill, um, data and reporting. Uh, I have a couple of case studies to share um, and just some next steps. So let's start with North Star Recycling. I don't know how many of you have heard of North Star Recycling, but we are a leading waste and recycling provider within um, various different industries. Um, we work mainly with manufacturers and distributors across the US. Um, we are technically national North America, um, servicing Canada and Mexico um, facilities as well. Um, our clientele can be anything within food and beverage, healthcare, uh, packaging. We work with a number of big companies. If you check out our website, you can see some big names on there. I'm not going to share them here, but um, what we're really focused on is helping large organizations with a number of different facilities find centralization and create um, a program that's really efficient, it's sustainable, it's cost effective, etc. Um, we also, that always starts with a single facility. So a lot of our clients start from the ground up working with one stream, one facility, um, just to see how it all works and see the benefit of really improving this piece of their program. So our services, um, like I mentioned, centralization, consolidation. Um, how we do that is um, we offer a number of different services to our clients, one of which is solutions for all byproducts. Um, what that means is that North Star is experienced and um, with working with all different waste streams when it comes to trash, recyclables, food waste, um, you name it. Um, we currently do this for all, all of our facilities that we work with today. We manage these kind of full scope programs across all their locations. Um, we also offer centralization in terms of service billing and reporting. Um, what that means is that um, we help conduct and ensure that scheduling and service goes smoothly. We help in crisis scenarios. We help with daily pickups. Um, we also track every one of those pickups. Um, we track them in an online system that's accessible. I'll talk a little bit more about data and reporting and why that's super important to having a really good waste and recycling program in place. Um, but we do all that for you. Um, and then we also track billing um, and make sure all the invoices are correct. They match up with the program that you've signed on for um, and everybody's paid or, or charged appropriately. Um, the third bucket on there is just expert guidance, um, cutting edge analytics. So again, that reporting feature really provides insights to our clients. Um, we have a lot of expertise um, since we do a, a number of uh, programs today in uh, the waste and recycling world. I think we move about like two million or billion tons a month or I mean, not a month, a year, something crazy. Um, but this little graph to the, the right here shows um, a little bit about kind of how that waste is diversified in our company. So a big portion of what we handle is actually organic waste. Um, we've really specialized in finding innovative solutions for organic waste materials. Um, the next big largest portion is recycling. So our core belief is waste has value. We wanna help companies recycle as much as possible, landfill as less or as small as as possible. Um, so as you can see, that disposal and waste to energy piece is really quite small. Um, we provide dedicated service teams, we provide ongoing development of programs, and we ensure that your program's compliant and safe and meets everybody's expectations, uh, local governments, federal governments, quality assurance teams within your company, et cetera. Um, this is a little slide I like to share. Just general best practices um, obviously something to keep in mind with all of your programs that you currently have in place is just checking the boxes to make sure you're doing all that you can to ensure you know the best solution possible smooth transitions reduced challenges that you might face in the industry um, so these are just a couple little snippets of things that we um, enact with our program obviously making sure you have permits up front, making sure you're doing some sort of trial loads, getting load by load feedback, sample testings, photos, um, making sure the recipient of your waste is really familiar and understands what they're getting um, before you, you sign on to a deal. Um, obviously making sure your, your programs are compliant. So if you're working with a single facility or a single processor right now, just confirming that they're meeting all the rules and regulations out there. Um, Having backup options, always a good thing. We, we as a national management company, having access to 
um, a number of vendors um, um, and um, a network across the US. I think it's over about 5,000 processing facilities. Um, having a good backup option for that force majeure, that crisis scenario um, is always really important. Um, this next slide here, just safety and compliance. I just wanna touch on this really quickly. Um, we've got auditory and regulatory specialists on our team, FISMA trained staff members, audit, auditing um, capabilities. Making sure your program is meeting all compliance factors is the number one piece. Um, so ensuring that you're sending the proper material, you're sorting correctly, you're reducing contamination, but largely um, making sure you're following any sort of regulatory bans, any waste franchises, you're getting documentation for the waste that you're sending out to ensure secure destruction is all just super important to waste and recycling. So I want to just zoom out a little bit, talk a little bit about the problem, frame the problem for you all. Um, a lot of this is definitely information you're aware of um, already. So um, just some quick facts. Um, first, um, specifically in organic waste. Um, organic waste makes up um, a huge portion of landfills um, today. I think um, I, in this stat here, Food and Ag Organization said one third of the world's food is actually wasted. Um, in the US, about 35% of the food goes unsold or uneaten. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Refed. It's an amazing resource out there. Lots of good data, um, lots of good tools to use, but um, I just wanted to call out some of those sources. Obviously, homes, um, people, residential situations um, produce a lot of food waste. Farms produce a lot of food waste. That's why there's these amazing imperfect markets showing up, misfit markets showing up. Uh, manufacturing, we all know, I think many of us on this call are manufacturers or distributors. Um, byproducts, line waste, expired product, all um, usually ends up in the landfill unless you have a really good sustainable program in place. Um, retailers, just with inventory management, food service, um, plate size, et cetera. So um, this stat over to the side, it's not just about obviously what you're wasting and, and kind of what Melissa put in the prompt. It's almost a double waste because it's all the resources that were used to make that product are also being wasted. Um, in addition, uh, greenhouse gas. So obviously that's a big factor when considering or talking about waste and recycling. Um, this kind of brings in together organic and non-organic waste. Um, how they interact in a landfill is really um, key um, for greenhouse gas emissions. Um, just a little summary for everybody. Um, there's obviously three main problems with landfills, toxins, leachate, and greenhouse gas. Uh, toxins are obviously toxic substances that come from waste, um, different sort of non-composable, decomposable products, plastics, electronics, has waste, things that end up in the landfill that they shouldn't. Um, those are releasing toxins when most likely interacting with organic waste, which creates some sort of acid. It's a, a weak um, acidic chemicals that help break down those products and release those um, toxic liquids out into um, the environment or into the um, landfill, et cetera, that's called leachate. Um, and then finally, the greenhouse gas, that's what's coming off um, the landfills. And I think everybody's aware, but mixture of methane, carbon dioxide, methane is very potent um, and is creating a big portion of the greenhouse gas in today's uh, world. Um, quick thing on emissions. Um, I'm sure everybody here is familiar scope one, scope two, and scope three, but for just a quick recap, um, scope one is obviously anything happening in the facility, any emissions produced at the facility. Scope two is mainly around electricity and energy um, purchasing. Um, and then scope three is anything that happens outside or beyond the facility. Um, I just pulled some of the categories. So there's 15 categories related with scope three emissions. Um, a number of them pertain to waste. Um, so when you talk fuel and energy related activities, if you're disposing of waste on a regular basis, that's additional hauling, um, going out um, with the truckloads, obviously, and fuel, et cetera. Um, transportation, distribution, those are things that obviously happen in everyday world with waste and non-waste, but can relate to waste as well. 
um, least generated in operation, obviously ending up in the landfill, causing some of those emissions. Um, any sort of processing. So I highlighted that because the end use that you send the material to also has a processing um, factor that comes into play, which is releasing more um, emissions or is obviously causing a purchase of energy or electricity to run that processing. So by creating the waste um, versus preventing the waste, you're also creating additional emissions elsewhere. Um, just a fun fact, if anyone knows where I pulled this picture from, it's from a movie called Duel. Um, great movie if you haven't seen it. Uh, last, I wanna just talk about resources. So there's an, a lot of amazing resources out there. Obviously, PSC is a great one um, for helping just get a hold of your sustainability program. North Star is obviously a help as well. Um, but there also are some online resources or some uh, calculators out there that are really helpful when trying to track your admissions. Um, if anyone's familiar with the WARM model, the EPA waste reduction model, um, very interesting, very good way to get estimates on kind of your greenhouse gas production. Um, Refed, again, has an impact calculator. And again, another good resource to use. And then the Greenhouse Gas Protocol website has a number of free tools and calculators. Um, so just wanted to throw that out there. Um, definitely things that everybody should check out if you're not familiar with them right now. Okay, next, I would love to talk about industry trends. So again, if any of this is redundant, if anyone already is aware of all of this, you know, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I just wanted to highlight it for anyone who isn't and just kind of recap kind of the problem and what's trending right now. So obviously consumers are seeing um, bigger concern with the environment. We all know that there's a global push for ESG goals. Every company that North Star works with is developing and trying to improve their ESG goals year after year, specifically in that um, sustainability environmental impact aspect. Um, and we're here to help them make those things happen. Landfill diversion, um, reduction in waste, et cetera. Um, there's definitely more of a push just from consumers to work with companies that actually have these goals. Um, I don't know if the pendulum has swung far enough where, where consumers are against purchasing um, with companies that don't have goals or aren't trying to make an impact. Um, but these stats on the right here just kind of show um, some sort of basic um, ideas on percentages of people who are really interested in a more eco-friendly company to partner to, to purchase from. Um, obviously, in the, the company standpoint, um, having a more positive impact is, is a lot of people's goals just from personal or from corporate or from site-by-site -site level employees. Um, everybody wants to have a positive impact. Um, maintaining that consumer approval is a big piece. Obviously, st staying relevant, staying competitive in the market um, are a big factor as well. Um, I want to dive into a couple different uh, industry trends across different um, factors as related to waste and recycling. So first is regulations are changing. Right? Um, there's a trend, obviously, for more um, stricter regulations or or scrutiny over waste in general. Um, obviously, anyone in the food industry is aware of um, bans on food waste to landfill. There's definitely an uptick. These are a couple of the states that have started to enact that. Um, this definitely causes issues, obviously, for generators um, with quality concerns, um, lack of infrastructure for diversion. Diversion can be a big push. Um, Norser helps companies all the time make that transition from landfill to a non-landfill solution and getting that correct and getting the sorting, the, you know, the logistics, the billing, the vendor management, the compliance, all that in um, wrapped up kind of um, with a new program is, takes a little effort, but it's definitely worth it. Um, it definitely sometimes involves process changes, but once those are set up and everybody gets it, um, there is just so much benefit. Obviously there's um, stricter reporting requirements. A lot of our clients work with other companies that are requiring of them to be more sustainable. Um, so being better about tracking and data is super important for a program. Even if you know that, hey, these boxes or these pallets get picked up by someone local and it happens once in a while is tracking that information is super key. Um, there's definitely a, a larger push 
um, especially abroad, with producers taking responsibility of waste, that kind of end of life analysis, packaging, et cetera. Um, I know this isn't really related to us yet, but single use plastic waste bans, like plastic bag bans, um, who knows what could evolve in that area, um, but that's just an interesting rule or regulation that has kind of come into play. And then finally, Clean Energy Act. So there's a lot of different states um, trying to put forth these um, clean energy acts um, to reduce carbon emissions in any way possible. So logistics trends, um, I think we're all very aware of this, especially right now, but obviously increased in fuel costs, um, increase in driver shortages with COVID and health and wellness of everybody involved. Um, we realize how fragile the logistics market is and how um, sensitive it is to everything that's going on in the world right now. Um, equipment shortages, that's been a big one. A lot of our clients wanting to make a switch to a more sustainable program might require some new equipment like compost or, I mean, compactors or scale systems, et cetera. And getting that right now is causing um, a little bit of a lead time, um, which again, shortens the chance of, of making that program happen as smoothly and, and swiftly as possible. Um, obviously, everybody has been kind of inundated. I don't know about anyone else on this call, but it's been quite a busy year for us and our clients. Um, so everything seems to take longer. Um, and then freight regulations are definitely always something that companies and, and haulers need to stay on top of in terms of trends. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is processing trends. So everybody's pushing for these, you know, sustainable solutions, but um, it's hard to get the infrastructure to uh, respond to all the waste. And a lot of the companies we work with on a processing standpoint, point, so composters, recyclers, um, haulers, et cetera, are just trying to keep up. Um, so a lot of the time, especially with new programs, we see contamination. Um, that's definitely trending as people try and make more of a switch and make it quick. Um, that can lead to contamination or issues with material at the processor's facility. Um, obviously, investment in equipment. Uh, if anyone isn't familiar with depackaging equipment, it's this amazing um, piece of machinery that you can throw a full pallet of packaged product in, and it actually grinds it and separates it so that the organic material goes out one way and the packaging goes out the other way and that organic material can be reused, repurposed, um, some alternative form like compost, animal feed, et cetera. So investing in those depackaging equipments is really expensive, um, but there's definitely a need. So that's kind of happening currently. Um, again, labor shortages, um, health and wellness of employees, um, that's definitely um, been on an uptick right now. Um, data tracking. So a big thing for um, our processors is they're being asked by new clients to not only take on material, start the sustainability program, but also be really exact about data and reporting, give them packaging weights, give them food weights, give them exact things, deconstruct their products, send, you know, paper one way, plastic one way, give them weights for each one. There's just so much detail that's got getting involved here. And a lot of these processors, again, are just trying to keep up. Um, and that data and reporting piece is hard to um, make happen. Um, the last thing I wanna mention is just increased rec reporting requirements. Also some interesting um, evolutions to reporting. Uh, we work a lot of times with anaerobic digesters and there is definitely a push for reporting kind of the amount of renewable energy that waste is creating at a, a anaerobic digestion facility. I find that so interesting, um, being able to track that, um, how much renewable energy your waste creates on the back end is just so fascinating. Um, the next one, generators. So this is the last one, but obviously as generators, as producers, there's a lot of trends and a lot of things you're trying to keep up with. So trying to keep up with increased diversion rates. I know a lot of companies are putting out percentages about landfill diversion. Making that happen is not the easiest task we know. Um, and it's just trying to keep up with those trends is really um, a key focus right now. Um, obviously, everybody's familiar with the waste hierarchy from the EPA. So moving product beyond landfill and incineration up to compost, anaerobic digestion, animal feed, donation, salvage, 
those kind of markets. Um, that push to move up the chain is really um, key and important. It's happening a lot in these kind of um, uh, resale opportunities, upcycling opportunities. That's really fascinating and interesting and, and kind of an industry trend standpoint. Um, finding solutions is hard. I mean, cold calling around, finding the right solution and the right provider, not knowing who is the right solution, the right provider for your specific waste. Um, sustainability reporting, keeping on track with that. Compliance reporting, keeping on track with that. Um, all very key things. Um, and then again, labor shortages, just mentioning that. Okay. Um, the next topic is just diversification. So this is, I want to dive in a little bit more to solutions for waste. And when you're preventing waste, how, where do you send it? What's the best avenue? Um, diversification is key. So obviously why divert? There's a lot of benefits. We already went over a lot of them. Just to recap, one, if you're diverting specifically from landfill or from waste to energy, um, there may be some cost reductions that are involved. Um, if you're sending up the, the EPA hierarchy to a more um, recyclable end use, um, if you're recycling more material versus throwing it away, there is the opportunity to save money and lower costs. So always something to look for. Um, a lot of the times in various markets, um, there are annual increases. And a lot of times with, with um, general composters or recyclers, um, getting fixed rates is more common. Um, better vendor relationships. So obviously when you're creating something for good and a positive impact, there's a lot of um, positive relationship um, factors that come into play there. Everybody's usually really excited about it. Uh, bulk transportation. So specifically comparing to landfill, if you're hauling a compactor or a front end loader dumpster, and you're hauling just a couple tons each time versus finding a way to transport that in a dry van trailer or bulk equipment in order to maximize load weights is a great, um, great thing for sustainability, for greenhouse gas emissions, for um, cost savings, et cetera. Um, again, reducing pollution, community goodwill, higher consumer satisfaction, um, and interest in your in your product, and then you know, more industry value overall. Um, this graph over here just shows some top environmental goals. Sustainable packaging is a big one. Zero waste is a big one. Greenhouse gas. I think everybody on this call could relate to these all in some capacity right now. Um, okay, so with diversification, obviously there's a lot of different avenues you can go for a lot of different materials and that pool is increasing. Those types of uh, abilities to handle hard to recycle materials is increasing. There's a lot of interesting, innovative companies popping up um, that are making it um, more possible to recycle more. Um, I just want to do a big call out to sorting. Sorting is just so key. Um, it's one of the first things we help companies do is source separate. Um, by sorting different commodities, you can increase the value, have a larger market for end use, find better end users, recycle more, uh, reduce contamination, et cetera. So, you know, sorting's the, the one thing I'd say come away with this, um, try and sort, and that might open up more options for you. Okay, um, organic waste innovations. And again, I apologize, a lot of this conversation is organic related. I am, we do both, Norsar does both. It just seems that more, as of recently, um, organic waste is obviously a big concern because most companies know how to recycle paper, they know how to recycle cardboard, etc. But these kind of food soil plastics, organic materials, sludges, grease traps, anything like that can be um, kind of a harder one to work with um, in this day and age. So obviously there's traditional methods, there's that food waste hierarchy again, um, but um, if anyone has organic waste, they're likely familiar with compost, anaerobic digestion, really amazing process, animal feed, land application, et cetera. Um, I want to take a moment to talk about some innovative markets. So if anyone isn't familiar with black soldier fly farms, um, these are coming up in the US a lot more common. Um, really interesting way to divert waste, um, pretty much feeding it to insects. And um, two key facts is one, obviously, 
the insect can be used as a protein source um, for animals, livestock, um, maybe even humans. Um, in addition, um, the actual poop that these, these bugs create is a supplement for fertilizer and it's very nutrient dense. And I think if anyone knows about fertilizer right now, it's definitely expensive and it's hard to come by and this could be a great avenue to find a, a new source. So um, obviously touched on upcycling markets, very interesting, a very easy way for companies to find a way to achieve savings and uh, more sustainable solutions. Um, so some recycling innovations as well. So again, everybody knows our general uh, pulping mills, sorting facilities, MRFs, um, aluminum recyclers, export markets always exist. Um, but there's a couple more interesting ones that have been a little bit more common as of late. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with pyrolysis, but it's pretty much turning plastic into oil that can be either burned or used again as fuel. Um, closed loop recycling projects are on the move. Uh, we work with a lot of companies that have glass packaging. They're trying to either recycle and then get turned back into glass packaging for their material or um, finding a way to get product returned from consumers. That's definitely a topic that a lot of people are addressing. Um, so just some, some innovative markets there as well. I wanna take a moment to talk zero waste to landfill. Um, I'm sure maybe a, a number of companies on this call are already there. Um, a couple of things I like to call out. So first, what is zero waste to landfill? Obviously it's removing waste from landfill, reusing, reducing, recycling. Um, incineration is usually the common end use for that final bit of material that cannot be reused or recycled. Um, how can zero waste landfill goals differ? So this is really important. I think there's a lot of um, various goals out there, but um, percentages is a key factor. I think with some certification processes, processes there's um, if you're less than 2% packaging to landfill, you can still get this kind of zero waste certificate. Um, so trying to find out exactly how far into zero waste do you want to be? Um, what percentage of landfill diversion do you want to achieve is something to consider um, and something to think about before, you know, making that pledge um, to being zero waste. The other one is packaging. A lot of um, the time we, we work with companies, especially with um, food products that are sending food out to an anaerobic digester or composter um, that has to be depackaged. The packaging can either be recycled or landfilled or incinerated. Um, I'd just like to say that um, finding end users who can not only process your waste and use it for a beneficial end use, but also handle your packaging in the most sustainable way possible is, I'd say, tricky, but on the uptick. I think a lot of processors are trying to adapt to dealing with packaging because that, um, you know, it does, we don't want to hinder the idea of sending packaged food waste or, or waste to a recycler just because they can't get that final bit to the landfill versus sending it all to the landfill. Um, so just something that's kind of evolving in the market for zero waste um, and how to respond to that. Um, the last is just making it official. I mean, certification processes exist or, or um, certifications exist out there for zero waste. There's a number of different companies that um, we work with and our clients work with to make that official. Um, obviously, accurate data and reporting. If you're going to achieve, you know, a, a goal, having good data to back that goal and make sure it's correct and exact and accurate um, is really the only way to tell if, if you've reached your potential. Um, just one other thing on zero waste landfill. So obviously North Star works with a lot of companies in achieving this, especially when it's an, uh, a national organization and there's a corporate push to be zero waste to landfill. Um, helping the individual facilities, I think as we learned in the beginning, many of the, our, the people on this call, their sites manage their own programs. So putting a big goal on them like this is sometimes a lot to achieve um, and having centralization and having support um, from a national standpoint um, and working with a company like Northstar um, really helps drive that um, program along and make sure everybody has support to make it happen. Um, some of the concerns we see in when we work with clients who are making this transition is obviously um, 
anything that diverts from the status quo is, is usually the most competition North Star ever deals with is making change is difficult. We totally understand that. Um, material types, um, something to consider. What is your waste stream? Is it going to be easily recyclable? Is it not? Um, volume, how much waste do you have? Distance is a factor. You know, are you sending this stuff to a waste energy facility that's 700 miles away? Um, is that more sustainable? Um, there are calculators to kind of help determine that um, versus sending to the landfill, which is 20 miles away. Um, cost is a big factor. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to save money when making a switch to zero waste landfill, but there also is um, incineration does cost money as well. So there is still cost related. Um, and last, just impact is just making sure whatever sustainable um, program you sign on to do is making sure you've got a, a impact involved and it, are you making the most positive impact with your waste. Um, one thing that Norsar just likes to do when we're phasing out approaches for zero waste to landfill programs is one, reduce and prevent as much waste as possible. So really working collaboratively with the sites, with the production line um, team members to understand where is this waste generated? How can it be for prevented? If it is made, how can we recycle it? Um, recycling as much as possible is really key. Using that money from savings through recycling and using that to invest in landfill diversion um, is a great kind of three-step approach um, to taking on zero waste. Um, I'd like to just share data reporting. I've already kind of talked about this. This is North Star's version. There's other versions that exist. I'm sure a lot of um, the companies on this call, you have your own programs for tracking um, data. It might be someone inserting invoice numbers, volumes, et cetera, um, reporting that to um, people above. Um, what Norser does is we kind of created this online reporting portal, which makes it really easy and accurate to access your data on a daily basis. Um, getting really clean data is important, again, um, and we go through that process of cross-checking and verification to make sure the data that we put in the system that your company is grabbing through Excel or um, export process um, in this processes in this in this platform um, is correct. So big focus on that. Um, data visualization, another key factor. Big thing we offer our clients is just getting insights through visualization visual visualization um, can be really helpful. So just walking through this picture here, um, this is an example of a, a national client. This is a, a single facility we have pulled up here, but um, showing, you know, being able to um, assess date range, um, pick a customized date range, look at the past year, look at the past six months to assess your waste volumes, recycling volumes, um, getting an idea on tonnage, costs, how much landfill you're at, or waste you're actually diverting. Um, there's a lot of interesting graphs. I like to highlight this one at the bottom is seeing that month to month year over year comparison of costs um, can be really interesting, especially to the sites as they're trying to reduce costs, save money, um, to have that kind of shown here um, in a, a visual format to be able to share with key stakeholders um, is, is very valuable. Um, finally, I just wanna share some case studies. So um, this is just a really basic one, um, I think really highlights um, a lot of benefits. So, we worked with a coffee manufacturer. They were landfilling a lot of expired product. It was packaged in brand sensitive packaging. Uh, and they were really worried about brand security and doing something that was compliant, but also being sustainable. Um, so we looked for a solution for this hard to recycle material. We found someone that prioritized brand security that achieved cost savings and sustainability. Um, and by diverting this to a compost facility with that depackaging equipment, which really does grind um, the packaging up to an unrecognizable form, um, and then either recycling or um, incinerating that packaging on the back end, landfilling, um, they were able to achieve the goals that they had set out to achieve, save some money, um, and then also be more sustainable. Um, this is just about zero waste to landfill. So we worked with a, a pet food company actually to achieve zero waste 
to landfill at all their manufacturing facilities. And after that was done, there was this secondary push of what about our distribution network? What about our third party network? Um, so North Star achieved zero waste to landfill um, beyond the manufacturing facilities in actually one year. And now we're managing over about 60 locations at zero waste to landfill. Um, so it's definitely possible. It's, we do it all the time. Um, it can be a real benefit and um, it's great to kind of extend it as far as you can, as far as your impact goes. Um, so beyond manufacturing, what's happening at your distribution centers. Um, this last case study is about mainly efficiency. Um, we worked with a company that was being over-serviced. I shared a little bit in the beginning about best practices, um, but um, over-servicing is oftentimes happen, happening a lot. Um, that means just being picked up too frequently with their trash stream and just, um, or too frequently with their waste stream, whatever it is. Um, so not only can you reduce costs by um, reducing numbers of pickups and really finding the most efficient format to send that waste out, whether it's bailing cardboard versus loose cardboard, whether it's putting a pressure gauge on a compactor, make sure it's full and it's actually picked up, whether it's setting your schedule to on-call versus scheduled pickups. Um, all great things to achieve reduced hauling, achieve savings, um, reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, et cetera. Um, so this is just one example. We worked with the company. We went from scheduled hauling to need-based service um, and their weight on their actual hauls increased tremendously, um, which um, allowed them to send less light loads, save them a lot of money. Um, they decreased greenhouse gas emissions, lower environmental footprint. So a really great um, program overall, a little tweak that can be really beneficial. Um, that is pretty much nearing the end of my presentation. I just wanted to share what's next. Um, I said talking action, but I meant taking action. So um, taking action can be hard. Um, North Star is here to help. Um, obviously, PSC is here to help. Um, I've got a meeting with John tomorrow to see how we can collaborate more. Um, but um, obviously, reach out for support. My contact information will be here. You can reach out through John and Melissa as well. Let's schedule a waste review. Let's review your program. Let's see if what you're doing is really the best you could be doing. Maybe there's something more, maybe there's a little tweak, maybe there's a different process, maybe there's a different end user, um, et cetera. Um, then let's work together and find improvements, opportunities, make those changes, work with the team on site, um, create centralization, see how you know one facility is doing it here and how we can pass that um, learning and that experience around waste and recycling management to other facilities and get that kind of centralized approach. Um, obviously, we can track the data, we can make sure it's sustainable solutions, um, and then we can look for ongoing improvement. So that's that's kind of it. That's kind of our model. Um, thank you again. That's all I have to share. Thank you, Abigail. Appreciate that. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I know there are several questions out there, and I'm just going to hand it over to Melissa to. Yeah. Um, so, Abigail, that was fantastic. Uh, thank you uh, so much. Uh, we get questions about waste and zero waste certifications and, and things like that um, at PSE uh, often. So we are taking questions at the Q&A. Um, part of the bottom of your screen and we've got a bunch so we'll get to as many as we can so uh first one abigail uh do you have any experience with compostable packaging when you're working with organic recycling that has compostable packaging great question um i we definitely don't work with it as much as we kind of would expect to work with it. Uh, I know it's still compostable packaging is kind of like a new thing. Um, I recently attended SBC Impact, or I actually saw <laughs> Melissa, um, learned amazing things about some new technology that is being put in place because obviously with compostable packaging, there's kind of two issues right now. One is that um, receivers of, of packaging, so composters who have deep packaging equipment, or taking in residential material with, you know, loose compostable packaging thrown in there, those composters are having trouble identifying what is compostable versus what is not. 
So a lot of times that compostable product or packaging ends up getting thrown away anyway. So, you know, hoorah for putting together that compostable packaging if it's not gonna make it into the actual compost pile. And then the second thing we're seeing is a lot of our recyclers are oftentimes receiving um, residential or even from uh, manufacturers and distributors. They're seeing compostable packaging mixed in with recyclable packaging and that is contaminating those loads and then also causing issues because they're not able to recycle that material those loads because they have to hand pick and process so i think there's a lot of amazing equipment and technology things going on with like sorting and taking photos and identification and robots pulling out little bits of packaging so a lot of cool stuff um, is happening yeah I will, I would just add to that. That is, um, if anyone has questions about their packaging, um, we do a lot of work in this area and this is why when implementing recyclable or compostable packaging, which is so important, um, we really recommend using the, how to recycle and how to compost label for these kinds of exact reasons, because, um, these kinds of packaging solutions are fantastic, but need to end up in the, in the same, in the, in the correct place. Um, all right. Lots more other questions. Um, we've got a good one. Um, Abigail, where can I find the calculator you mentioned about calculating whether sending something further away is a more sustainable option? Yeah. Great question as well. So I don't know how exact everything is. I know that North Star ourselves has, has been trying to get more, um, in the know with these sort of calculators, but I do know, I think the two that I shared, I think refed has a calculator that you can type in kind of like the distance you're traveling and the waste volume um, and the location. I think it pops out some sort of calculation there. And I think also that EPA warm model um, has, um, uh, it's kind of like an Excel sheet, master Excel sheet. And there's a tab on there where you can actually type in kind of like the weight of the truck, the distance it's traveling, um, et cetera, and get some more um, data. Um, Abigail, we have some questions. What you keep mentioning refed. I think we have some people who don't know who okay. or what that is. Yeah. Refed is an amazing company. Dana Gunders um, is part of that organization. And um, I just attended their um, waste summit. They called it the food waste summit um, in Minneapolis a couple of weeks ago. Um, but they're just a really amazing organization. I, I stress that everybody go and check out their website, but um, they do a lot for, for data and tracking of waste and trying to provide resources to, um, to companies, to manufacturers in the form of, of data and stats, um, and also in the form of tools. They have um, this impact calculator. They also just came out with a new, um, new piece of technology I think called the Insight Calculator. You'd have to check me on that one, but I, I would just check them out. They're a really good source of information and um, support. Great. We've got uh, uh, quite a few questions around kind of um, next steps. So as Abigail uh, mentioned, um, Pet Sustainability Coalition is in the process of um, working with North Star Recycling to add this to our project offerings. Um, so members will hopefully be able to soon um, use uh, their project credit within their membership for this kind of work. So I just want to uh, call that out there. Uh, we do have questions. Um, are you only U.S.? So we have a couple people asking, uh, do you work and do work in Canada, for example? We do work in Canada. So we're pretty much all of North America. I'd say the bulk of our business is in the U.S., but uh, we do Canada and Mexico. Okay. Haven't gone global yet. I would love that. I could start doing site visits in different countries as well as the U.S. It would be great. I agree. Um, we've got a really great question that comes up with packaging a lot. It says, I'm curious about pyrolysis as a solution. It seems uh, that the process of existing plastic to end of life of oil to burn would also be highly impactful. Can you elaborate on the reduction of impact pyrolysis might provide? Truthfully, I will be honest, I can't get into the like science-based details about it. I just, we have teams on North Star that are dedicated to various waste streams. So we have organic waste teams, we have um, general recycling waste streams that specialize in those kind of avenues and that innovative research. If you're interested in learning more, definitely, again, we could set up a call, we could talk about it in more detail. I just know that it is an evolving 
um, process for plastic waste. Um, we have a company that we're working with right now that's able to take slightly food soiled plastics and go through this process, which I don't know if anyone works with food soiled plastics, but for the longest times, I mean, we used to get calls about blood soiled LDP stretch film for meat manufacturers. I'm sure a lot of pet food companies on this call deal with that. And that's a tough one. So if there's a, an option to potentially find solutions, um, we're trying to stay on track of that so we can support our customers. So sorry, I can't yes. provide a little bit more. I can provide a little bit of information. So um, pyrolysis uh, recycling, I'm going to step back a little bit. So there's mechanical recycling, which is, you know, something we think of like with this plastic bottle right here, which is going through a mechanical process is sometimes melted, it's sometimes pelletized, and then um, goes um, and is in the process of being made into something else. Um, it's referred to as circularity if you're able to turn it back into the thing that it was to begin with. Um, there's a whole other growing kind of recycling, sometimes called chemical recycling, sometimes called advanced recycling which is an umbrella term for a whole bunch of different kinds of technologies. Um, pyrolysis is one of them. And it's the process of taking plastics and actually on a chemical level, breaking the chemical compounds of those molecules to turn it back into oil and gas that then can theoretically be, and in practice, a lot of the time, then be turned um, back into plastic. And the idea is um, using it as a replacement for virgin oil stocks and virgin plastic stocks. It's something that um, PSC is working on through our Flex Forward program. So that's a great question. Um, we've got another one um, we, regarding healthcare. So in, in, in the pet industry, it's not just food, right? It's a lot of times, you know, supplements or those, you know, veterinary, those kinds of things. So regarding healthcare, plastic is so abundant. What have been some successful methods for diverting plastics, especially number four from the landfill? I can't, again, I can't speak to specific plastic numbers, but, um, one of the ones on there was decking. Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. I think a lot of pet food companies deal with a lot of inbound pet food products that are in plastic bags. Um, and decking is a really interesting option for that. I think maybe a lot of your clients already, members already do that with their plastic waste. But um, other than that, it's just some interesting things about, I know there's some other questions here about like fully recyclable plastics versus compostable. I think there's just so much going on right now. I'm still trying to figure out the best ways to deal with more plastic waste in there. Um, actually, at the refed conference, there was an interesting point about um, preserving the, and this maybe doesn't apply to healthcare as much, maybe it does, maybe different um, medications or anything that come in plastic bottles. Preserving the shelf life of a product is a really interesting factor in sustainability because if you have a sustainable packaging form but it reduces the shelf life and therefore it expires more quickly that's also causing more waste so there was an interesting talk about actually creating packaging that maybe isn't as recyclable but is extending the shelf life and where does that benefit with which is more beneficial extending the shelf life being more a, a fully recyclable plastic What's the option? I'd push for both, you know, a plastic that's recyclable and extends the shelf life, but I know that's much harder to achieve than I could ever imagine. So, yeah. Well, thanks. We've got a lot of questions um, that we're not going to have a uh, time to get to. I, specifically, we've got a bunch around design of packaging. Um, I'll just say packaging, as, as many of you know on the call, is a huge area of work for PSC. So if you'd like uh, to learn more about our packaging work, or if you have specific design questions, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to your member services specialist at any time. Um, but thank you so much, um, Abigail, for your fantastic content. And I will pass it back over to John to get us wrapped up. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Melissa and Abigail. Uh, just want to remind you about our upcoming uh, webinar in June. Uh, this one's going to be titled Juneteenth in Action. And we're looking forward to celebrating uh, some of our differences, our similarities, and the types of cultures that we have together. Um, in this seminar, we'll be learning different tips on how any organization can create a culture of inclusion and belonging year round as well. 
And I see the poll has launched. Thank you, Melissa. <laughs> uh, please just take a moment before we leave today and uh, just fill out this poll. How would you rate this webinar on a scale of one to five? One being poor and five being excellent. So I want to thank you all for attending today. Uh, thank you all for those great questions. And again, if you have any follow-up, you can reach out to us at PSC and Abigail as well. And we'd love to speak to you again in the future. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, John. Thanks, Melissa.